Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our online service today. Thank you for joining us. We take it very seriously, and it is an honor for us to have you join us via YouTube and your device. Let me say thank you to our team. We've got some special music planned for you guys this morning. And uh, thank you to Phil and Joey for making sure everything runs on the technology side of everything. We've all kind of reached our saturation point, and if you're like me, you're ready for this to be over. So let's do this. Let's make the best of this. Let me encourage you to gather your family, get your Bible, get your coffee, and let's worship with all we've got this morning. After our first song, we've got our missions moment, and uh, during that time, you can also give your offering at philipschapel.com slash give, or you can take advantage of the link on your app. And that said, let's worship this morning. Make sure that you post those pictures. We so enjoy seeing those each week. Make sure that you check in at Phillips Chapel and tag us so that we can see them and let us know what worship looks like for you. Please pray for us this morning as we engage in this. We promise you that we're praying for you. And let's worship together in song. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am, redeemed. check in on some of our missionaries and find out what they've been doing. First, from Jamie and Heather Lee, who are planting Bridge Church in Champaign, Illinois. They've been busy partnering with the Central Illinois Food Bank and another church to deliver food to people who can't get out of their houses. Bridge Church is also, like we are, meeting in Zoom groups and streaming their services online. Jamie says that he has noticed an uptick in the number of visits that they are getting on their Sunday morning Facebook Live service so he is hoping that when church is able to meet again in person some of these new people will begin to attend church and as you know they have held their Sunday services in a theater in the past Jamie is thinking that the economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic may bring about the closure of their theater so he asks us to pray that God will open doors for them to find a new place to hold services in the future should that happen 
We have a picture here of one of Jamie's sons with a friend before service time. I think clearly that was before social distancing. And then we also have a picture of their current worship time, which is set up now that they're on Facebook Live. Jamie said that on Good Friday, he and the Easter Bunny delivered some baskets and eggs to children in his church. I'm guessing that the bunny suit served as his protective mask and the kids were very glad to see them. Jamie asked us to pray for wisdom for them as regarding their facility, whether they are able to meet there as a church in person again, and also to pray that they will use this time to prepare for the future and that they will be able to reach more people who might attend church later Later if they're watching through social media right now. From Josh and Lydia Provo, who are planting New Life Schumann in Schumann, Bulgaria, first and foremost, here is Pavel, or Pavcho, as they're calling him. When I wrote and asked, Josh explained that in Bulgaria, putting Cho on the end of a name is like when we put a Y on a name, like calling Don, Donnie, or Nick, Nikki. He even sent me a voice recording so that I could practice saying it right. Josh says that Pavcho is quite a character, and I think that will translate in some of the pictures that we get to see here, and that they are praying that he takes after the Apostle Paul, his namesake, and uses his gifts to reach the nations for the Lord. We get to see a few pictures of Pavel, or Pavcho, with his forever family. The Provos and we can also extend a welcome to the family of God, Josh's friend that we have been praying for that we have known as E. Well, we can now know his name. It is Ere. He has made a decision to follow Jesus and is making efforts to put off the old ways and put on the new. Please pray for Ere that he will be strong in his walk and that he won't get discouraged or deceived. Josh says that he has begun his discipleship lessons and that Sevdi has now completed all 24 of his and he has already preached his first sermon. Josh is so encouraged by those in his church who have sacrificed their own resources to give food to those in need at this time. New Life Schumann is partnering with social services to deliver food to 10 families in and around Schumann. They have already made one delivery and will be making another in a couple of weeks. Josh says that their prayer request is the same one that is echoed by churches and church planners the world over, that God would use this global pandemic trial to draw many people to himself. Pray that as people seek God, that they will not be led astray by other ideas, but will find the one true living God. Lastly, if you've been following along with David and Mimi Reeves, you know that most of their fundraising efforts in the United States have been put on hold since churches are not meeting in person right now. Please pray that God will provide the needed funding for them to return to the field in France this summer. Since their baby girl Jade is due in May, they may not get to do much traveling even when churches are able to meet again. So please ask God for his wisdom and provision for them. Mimi was able to video chat this week with a friend of hers named Anna that we have prayed for in the past. Mimi said that Anna has lots of questions about God and that they have had many conversations over the last year and a half about God and about becoming a Christian. Earlier this week, Anna sent Mimi a video of herself playing the guitar and singing worship songs and said that faith has become very important to her lately as a result of the current crisis. Continue to pray for Mimi as she answers questions and talks with Anna about God and pray that Anna will make a decision to follow Christ as her Savior. Each of our missionaries is so thankful for our support and prayers. They tell me that they are often. Please continue to lift them up and ask God to bless them and give them grace and creative opportunities to reach others for God's kingdom during this time.
flesh is weak. You know I'd give anything for remedy. And I'll ask a thousand more times to set me free today. Oh, but even if you don't, I pray. Help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the Savior more than the saving. Help me want the giver more than the giving. Oh, help me want you, Jesus, more than anything. I think we need to probably review some this morning as we begin our series again on worldview. It's been, uh, I think this is the fifth week now that we've been streaming online, and so it's been equally as long since we've been in this series, and so we need to review. And, and during that five weeks, it feels like I've entered into a second adolescent period. Um, it doesn't add up because when I look in the mirror, I see a balding fat man, but I'm grounded and I want to eat everything in the house. And um, that's just kind of the way things have gone. But as we review, here's what I want you to know, okay? Every worldview has practical and real-world consequences. It impacts the way that we live. That's why it's so important. Undeniable evidence of this is found in a person's relationship to authority. Who controls them? To whom do they yield? Where do their allegiances lie? Who or what do they obey? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about authority. And so as we review, let's just kind of unpack maybe once again what this looks like depending upon your worldview. Because if you're an atheist, then you reject any idea of supreme authority. Rule is by chance. If you have a position, it is simply by chance. Any authority structure that exists in society or in the home is learned, and therefore submission to that authority is only necessary when it ensures your survival. Human intellect is supreme according to the rationalist, and thus intellect is the final authority. Rationalism stands opposed to institutionalized authority in the same way that it is opposed to what it calls blind faith. Obedience, then, to authority is only necessary when it is considered reasonable or appropriate. Humanism rejects the idea of supreme authority for what it calls a democratic and ethical life stance. Now, you may remember back five weeks ago now that that's just a fancy turn of phrase for mob rule. The final authority in humanism is majority opinion. What the people want is sovereign and therefore, that must be obeyed. If you're an existentialist and you focused on human experience, then every human being is a free moral agent. Existentialists reject the idea of slavish morality for personal autonomy. Adherence to a set of laws is only necessary if it promotes self-fulfillment and gratification. Now that we've kind of unpacked that, where do we stand as Christians? If we have a biblical worldview, a theistic worldview, a worldview with God at the center, 
authority begins and ends with God. His authority is supreme. It is unchallenged. It is intrinsic to His nature. God's power and God's control is total. It is absolute. It is without exception. And it is without limitation. Also without exception, then, is this. Any authority possessed by anyone else other than God has been delegated. It is warranted or derivative. How well or how poorly they use that authority is another matter. And so we need to put on the right glasses so that we can see and interpret what we see in our world correctly in a Christ-honoring way, in a God-honoring way. What we're saying is this. Power, authority, has only one source, and that source is God Himself. It's true in every sector. It's true in every area of society. It applies to civil governments, which we saw several weeks ago. It applies to the home, which we also saw several weeks ago. We'll find out next week that it applies to the church. And today we're going to see that it applies to the workplace environment. Everywhere there is authority, these principles apply. And so when it comes to authority, these workplace relationships that we're going to talk about today present us with a different kind of responsibility. It's unique to that environment, unique to that sphere. The investment and the return on investment are different in the workplace than they are concerning civil government or the home or even what we find in the church. At work, we invest our time and our energy and our talents, if you will, and we get a paycheck in return. We get paid back for our investment. We're not under a covenant as we are in the home, and that means that when it comes to the workplace, if you fail at work, it's completely different than being unfaithful to your spouse. And I hope you understand that. It stands to reason. We're not subject to the same kind of punitive laws that we are to civil government. Failing to pay taxes is largely different than failing at work. If you fail at work, you get fired. You don't go to jail. Does that make sense? And so I hope you're tracking with me. What I want to do now is I want to read our text. And we're, we're in Colossians chapter 3 in verse 22. And I want you to gather your Bibles and let's open those up together. These verses are going to be on the screen for you to follow along if you don't have one. But let's read the Word of God together. This is God's Word to us concerning our worldview and how that impacts the relationships that we have at work. Verse 22, Colossians chapter 3. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality, no favoritism. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Let's pray and ask God's blessings upon His Word, and then we will uh, jump into our thoughts this morning and dig more deeply into this passage. Bow with me in prayer, will you please? Heavenly Father, this is Your Word for us today. And as we enter into a state of mind where we can see and address our worldview, help us to do so accurately according to Your Word. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us into the truth. Testify to us of Jesus. Help us to sanctify Him in our minds and in our hearts and glorify Him through our obedience to that which we hear this morning. Father, I do pray that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds. Let our worldview be Christ-honoring and God-honoring. Help it to impact the way that we live the Christian life in this world. It's very, very important right now, Lord. We know that. And so I pray that you would help us today. For your glory's sake, in Jesus' name, amen. So now as we come back to our thoughts today, and, and we read this passage of scripture that has to do with bond servants and masters we need to kind of discuss that touchy subject i suppose before we go any further it goes without saying that these circumstances described 
in this passage are largely different than what we experience in the workplace. And here's why. You're an employee, not a slave. And that's what the word bondservant means in this text. It's the Greek word doulos, and bondservant is too soft a translation. It means slave. It means that you are bought by your master, that you are owned, you are a piece of his property. And so that comes with certain stipulations. Slaves had no rights. They had no freedoms. And the fact of the matter is, as an employee, when you go to work, you have freedom to choose what to do and who to do it for. Slaves didn't have property. They had no abundance. And, and we in America especially enjoy a certain level of abundance and affluence that they did not. And so we need to understand that before we go any further. And we need to understand how maybe we can apply this accurately to our situations at work. When we talk about slavery, you may be wondering why the Apostle Paul and the Word of God, for that matter, do not address this evil institution and condemn it outrightly. And to be honest with you, there are times that I have scratched my head wondering why God just doesn't say, don't do this, it's wrong. The fact of the matter is, in the Gospels, Jesus took the same approach concerning many of the social issues of his day. He never outrightly condemned them, but instead taught the truth and offered grace to people, knowing that it was the Gospel, as it changed people's hearts, that would become the great equalizer. The Christian worldview, then, it sees all people as equals, no matter if they own the company or they sweep the floor at the company. And so redeeming grace brings people of affluence and people in poverty, people who own the company and people who work for the company. In Paul's case in the New Testament, people who owned other people as property and slaves, it brought them all together in the church, and they were all equal, if you will, will at the foot of the cross. These social and economic barriers are removed in the gospel where there is neither bond, there is neither slave, nor free, for all are one in Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. And so it's important that we understand that as we go forward. It is the gospel that transforms this relationship between bond servant and master into a proper one one of grace and equality, one that we can accurately take and overlay over our circumstances at work. And we can make the case then that as the gospel changed people's hearts, it also changed their worldview, and that this evil institution of slavery began to crumble. And it is also, as I said, why we can accurately apply it to our working relationships today. And so as we overlay the instructions given to Christian bondservants and Christian masters in Colossians chapter 3, what do we learn about our worldview and the workplace? There are four principles that come to light from this text. They appear generally, so we'll reference them as we go along. I want you to follow along with me in the text. First is this. When we look at Christian bondservants, and masters in the New Testament church, and we overlay that over our working relationships, we realize that as Christians, those of us with a biblical worldview, our trust is fixed. Our trust is fixed. Now, we're going to spend most of our time here because I believe it addresses the spirit of the age. I believe this is really, really important for all of us right now especially in light of the social and economic changes that are going on because of this pandemic. There are some people in our church, in the world, that have the gift of faith, that, that they have an easier time of believing and trusting, and so this may come easier to some than it does for others. But most of us have to be intentional about trusting the Lord. We have to make conscious decisions in the moment to trust the Lord, Control freaks have to work at it. And I understand that and I relate to that because I like to be in control of my circumstances. And it's one of the things that this pandemic has exposed. That, that it exposed that in me, this shortcoming in me, perhaps more than, than any other thing in recent years. But trust is a learned behavior because of the fact that we are really good at trusting in other things. 
Let's be honest, because that's the case, isn't it? We tend to trust in things that we can control. We trust in things that we can see. We trust in things that we can touch. And so we have to consciously, intentionally work at trusting the Lord. But in a biblical worldview, our trust is fixed. And this may sound like an overstatement. What I'm going to say may sound like an overstatement. But I believe that in your job, depending on your worldview, your job will become two things for you. It will become a means for self-aggrandizement and self-promotion. You will treat it only as a means to get ahead and advance yourself. Or it will become the means for self-fulfillment and self-gratification. It will become the means by which you please yourself. And I believe that a wrong worldview will lead to moral and ethical compromises at work in order to get those two things done. Character then takes a back seat to advancement and integrity acquiesces to your sense of achievement. Now I hope that makes sense. And maybe I overstated, maybe I didn't. Maybe that's entirely accurate, but I did so to prove a point. And yet I also did so cautiously because the Bible has much to say about our work, doesn't it? If you were to turn to the book of Proverbs where the fool, one who is lazy, is condemned because they refuse to work, God has a lot to say in the book of wisdom about our working relationships. We have to admit that God created us to work, to be productive, to be creative. And so to refuse to work, to be lazy, is to deny one of the many purposes for which God created us. But work is not all there is. Because in the New Testament, we also see things like greed and avarice condemned. In the New Testament, we are instructed to work with our own hands, to provide for our own families. If we fail to do so, then we are worse than an infidel and we have denied the faith. But we also are to work and to save so that we have something to give. We are to be generous and we are to be content. We know that our lives do not consist of the abundance of our possessions. And so what the Bible tells us about work is often counterintuitive to our consumer experience here, especially in our American culture. And so as it relates to our jobs, and when we're talking about our trust being fixed, how we feel about our jobs and how we do our jobs often reveals where our trust is placed. We either trust in ourselves and our ability to perform, which is ironic, or we trust in God, who promises to give us our daily bread. Now, how can we tell the difference between the two? How can we self-locate where we are in either of those two points? Some clarifying questions need to be asked. I can't answer these for you. I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit will help you answer them this morning as you listen. But let's ask some clarifying questions when we talk about our trust being fixed. It's either in ourselves, in our ability to perform, or it's in God who has promised to give us our daily bread. So let me ask you this. Is your identity and your life's purpose tied to what you do for a living? Because, can I be honest with you? For years, for, as a matter of fact, for the majority of my lifetime, that was the case for me, even as I entered the ministry. My identity, my sense of purpose was tied to what I did. But our identity as believers is in Christ, not in what we do, not in the paycheck we receive. And so we need to understand the difference there. Clarifying question number two, is your vocation the main source of joy in your life? Do you get more joy out of what you do for a living than you do in Christ? Do you find more joy in your career than you do in God's Word or your family or some of those things that are eternal when our jobs are temporal? Question number three, who is honored by your accomplishments? Who gets the praise and the credit? Maybe a better way to phrase that is, are you doing what you're doing for a job because you're getting a pat on the back? Or is Christ honored by what you do? Clarifying question number four. Is Christ more precious to you than your reputation? 
than the acclaim of your boss or your coworkers. I think that's self-explanatory. Clarifying question number five. This is the final one. Have there been moral or ethical compromises so that you could fit in at work, so that you could advance at work, or maybe on the other side of that, have there been moral or ethical compromises so that you could go unnoticed and not create waves or stir up trouble? Have you sacrificed your integrity, your Christian witness, to, to go with the flow at work? Those self-locating questions help us understand where our trust is placed. And they're pretty relevant, aren't they? They're extremely relevant considering all that is going on in the world right now. I remind you that Paul is writing to slaves. They had no freedom. They did not enjoy the freedoms that we do, and yet they might have been tempted, like we are, to think that an exchange of circumstances might be the answer to all of their problems. They might be tempted to think that their freedom might be the answer that they're looking for, but yet this text addresses that in a different manner. When we look at our culture today, many people are facing furlough right now or cutbacks. Many people are working from home. Many people are looking at being laid off. There's so much uncertainty in the world today and in the workplace. And so we might be tempted to put our trust in bigger bank accounts that are funded by better paying jobs and bigger salaries. We might be tempted to do whatever it takes to keep our current job even at the expense of our character and our integrity, thinking that that is the only way that we can provide for ourselves. And I believe this current crisis then exposes some gaps between our worldview and our theology. And as I mentioned a moment ago, and in, 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 as I continue to be transparent, I, I, this, this is where I found myself, thinking that, that I have to do whatever it takes to, to keep this job or to keep this going or I'm going to make this person happy. Otherwise, I'm going to be out on my ear and we're going to have to, be, to go without. And that exposes an enormous gap between our worldview where we think, we, we say that we believe that God is in control and that His power is unchallenged and, and absolute and that He is sovereign over all things and yet we are trying to maintain control of something that we think is going to provide for us. And so this exposes where our trust is fixed. So instead, let me encourage you and let me remind you that God provides. A worldview with God at the center sees Him as the supply and the source for every need. Every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father in heaven with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is with you and He will never leave you or forsake you. And so we can go with and, and say with the psalmist that those who seek Him will have no lack. If we seek His kingdom first, everything that we need will be provided for us. That God Himself will make sure that we are taken care of out of His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God provides. And so we need to understand that as we go forward because our trust is fixed. We will either trust in ourselves, in our ability to perform, or we will trust in God who promises to give us our daily bread. Now that we've unpacked that, let's move on to number two. Because the second principle, I think, that appears here in this text that we read, Colossians chapter 3, 22 through chapter 4, verse 1, is this. Life doesn't always fit into compartments. We like it too because it's neat and it's tidy. And, and those of you who are like me, who like to control your circumstances and you like to have a measure of control because it makes you feel safe, you like it when life fits in compartments. But life doesn't work that way. And especially with regard to our worldview and our relationships at work, life doesn't fit into compartments. Our worldview is sacred, and not just at church, not just on, on Sundays, not just now as you're gathered around your TV or, or your, your device. Your worldview is not just sacred in this moment. It's sacred at home. It's sacred at church. It's sacred on the job. It's sacred out in the world. And we can't compartmentalize. We can't be different people in different environments. 
with different outlooks depending on where we are and different values depending on who we're around. We have to be the same all the time with a biblical worldview that, that demands that. To, to be anything else is disingenuous and that makes us, well, that makes us a hypocrite. And so the instruction we receive here in this text is critical. Verse 22 in particular really brings out the fact that this is a character issue. When we talk about compartmentalizing our lives, if we do that to the extreme, that's disingenuous, it's inauthentic, it's hypocritical. And so it becomes a character issue. And when we're talking about character at work, character at work is best displayed by a genuine desire to fulfill your responsibilities, even when no one is looking. That we don't do it as with eye service. And really that means that when somebody's watching, that you only work or you only do a good job or you're only concerned about your character or your integrity when somebody's looking. You don't do it with eye service as people pleasers. Our concern is not with the superficiality of appearances, what people think, but with a job well done. We want to do our best. Why? Because we are serving the Lord Christ. We are working as unto the Lord and not unto men. That's where the biblical worldview intersects life at work. No matter who you're employed by and no matter what you do for a living, you need to understand that at the end of the day, that sphere is limited and God's sphere is total. So you are serving the Lord Christ. The truest demonstration then of character at work on the job is sincerity of heart, a singleness of heart. This implies consistency. That idea of of singleness of heart or sincerity of heart means that you have a a single eye toward your work. That that you're consistent, that you're dependable, that you're going to be the same, that you're not all over the map. There's no gamesmanship, there's no sleight of hand, there's no working when somebody's watching and being lazy when somebody's not. There's no flattery to get ahead. There is just unflinching character matched by genuine hard work. I hope you understand what this means as we talk about life not fitting into compartments. Because the Lord has called His people, you and me, to full, single-hearted living and working in this world. That's what it means to be a human being. And when we look at the New Testament church, Paul writing to bond servants in the church, they were part of the fellowship, regarded as brothers and sisters in Christ. They shared in the same expectations of consistency. They were people who sincerely worshipped Christ on the Lord's day and who willingly worked for Christ on Monday through Friday. And so this is important. Listen to me. Your life doesn't fit into compartments. Your worldview won't let it. If God is at the center, if you have a biblical worldview, then you need to be the same person on Sunday with your Bible in your lap as you are on Monday in front of a computer or behind the wheel of a truck or no matter what it is, with a hammer in your hand or pushing a mower, whatever it is that you're doing, you're the same. And the same expectations of consistency and genuineness and authenticity and character are expected no matter where we are. And so I hope you understand. Our trust is fixed. Life doesn't always fit into compartments. The third principle is this. And as we pick up some steam here and we bring this to a close. Work is worship. Work is worship. If God created us to worship, and we look back at the way God created in the garden, so much of our worldview is formed within the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. When God created Adam, he put him in the midst of the garden that he had made, and he gave him a job to do. And so that means something. Before the fall, God created us to work. Work is different now because of the fall. But if work is something that God created us to do, then that means work is not always about the paycheck. It's not just about getting paid. When you clock in, as I already mentioned this, but you are working for Christ. And often we don't see it that way. And again, in a moment of transparency, I need to be honest. I I know I didn't. 
As a matter of fact, I really never did. And I often wonder how different my experience would have been building houses and working retail when we were in Bible college and, and even in the different pastorates, the different churches I pastored until now. I wonder what that would have looked like had I understood that I could, I could build houses for the glory of God and that, that I, could, I could preach the gospel for the glory of God. And it, this really, if we understand work as worship, it demolishes that barrier between sacred and secular. That, that if you're serving the Lord Christ, whether you're in a doctor's office or a secretary or, or, or doing landscaping or whatever it is that you're doing, if you're at a bank, then, then, then you're worshiping as you do it. And that makes it sacred. It, it, there's a redeeming quality to it. And oftentimes, we fail to see it that way because we can't get past the long hours or the unreasonable pay or the overbearing boss or the unreasonable or, or, or annoying coworker. We can't get past all of those things, and so we fail to see what we do as worship. But, but look back with me at the text, and I want you to understand the certainty the assurance that we're given that if we go into work and, we, and, and if you clock in tomorrow, no matter what it is you do, and, and you do that for the Lord Christ, then for certain you will receive from the Lord Himself. The Lord will make sure that you will receive the inheritance as a reward. That means that you're not just logging hours to get paid at the end of the week, that you're making deposits in the age to come. That, that you're not working to gain entrance to heaven. That's not what is implied, but there is a legacy that follows you into eternity because it is the Lord Himself that you serve. This is critically important, loved ones. That what you are doing on the job for the sake of the gospel, because of your worldview, you are making deposits in eternity. Your legacy of hard work, of integrity, of character will follow you into heaven. It's so important. So we understand that our trust is fixed. Life doesn't always fit into compartments. We like it too, but it doesn't. We need to be the same at work as we are at church, the same at home as we are in the public eye. And then we need to see work as worship. What you do is sacred if you do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, this last little bit of instruction. I want to encourage you to remember your master in heaven. One bit of instruction for those in authority. To the masters. To those of you who are employers, who are business owners. To, to those of you who have authority over other people in the workplace. You need to be reminded of your master in heaven. You are under ultimate authority. Your authority, your control, is limited to the sphere that God gave you. Whatever power you have over other people has been delegated to you. And you need to remember that God's control and that God's power is total. It's unchallenged. And so that means something. Now I want you to listen. Lean into your TV and listen. If you have authority at work, that means that you're not God. Okay? When we apply that to Caesar, Caesar is not God. When we apply that to the home, the husband and the wife, they're not God. When you're at work, the boss is not God. That sphere is limited, and you need to remember your master in heaven. And so, to both the employer and the employee, this is my final challenge to you. The Christian faith is not a reason to take advantage of of the people you work with. That, that, that if you're a Christian employer, you're not to take advantage of the people that work for you because you have a shared faith. If you're a Christian employee, you're not to take advantage of the person you work for because you have a, a shared faith. Your faith, your worldview, is not an excuse for half-hearted, shoddy work. It's not an excuse to be cheap or stingy that you need to provide a fair day's work. You need to keep your commitments and do what you are hired to do. If you employ people, you need to pay a fair day's wage. And you need to pay it on time. And you need to take care of the people that work for you. 
Why? Because your sphere is limited. The authority that you have has been delegated to you by God himself, whose power and whose authority is complete and total and supreme. And so you need to remember your master in heaven. He is just and he is impartial. And you will reap what you sow. There is no partiality. God's not going to show favoritism to your boss if he's cheap and stingy. God's not going to show favoritism to you if you don't provide for a fair day's work for a fair day's wage. Don't take advantage of the situation because you'll reap what you sow. Remember your master in heaven. So I'd like to encourage you to do something as we bring this to a close. We've got a song prepared for you as we close out our service. As the ladies take their place behind me, I want to encourage you to do something for me. I want you to surrender this relationship, this working relationship to the Lord. Especially now. This is so pertinent right now because of what's going on and And your business may be one of those fortunate ones that's thriving right now, or you may be looking down the barrel at cutbacks or even being let go. You may be tempted to think that you have to do whatever it takes to keep your job, even to sacrifice your character or your integrity. You may be tempted to to put your job ahead of your family or your relationship with God because of the circumstances right now. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to surrender that working relationship to the Lord. We need to honor Christ in the way that we work, the way that we employ people, the way that we do our jobs. It may mean you need to look elsewhere for work. And that's, that's a tough pill to swallow right now. I get it. But if, you're comp- if, you're, if your character is compromised and, or you're looking at having to do something immoral or unethical, then you might need to look somewhere else for work it may mean you need to keep your commitments you may need to just suck it up buttercup and do what you are hired to do the holy spirit will show you but i want you to surrender that relationship to the lord i also want to encourage you to do one other thing here i wonder if you've given him your heart as this next song is sung I want to invite you to abandon formerly held beliefs and to trust and to treasure the living Christ. That that you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. The Bible says that if you'll do that, you'll be saved. And so I, I want to encourage you to do that. Just give Him your heart as you surrender this relationship to Him as we sing this next song for the glory of God. the shore and steady anchor in the fury of the storm when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when my sinking hopes are few I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ the shore and steady anchor, while the tempest rages on, When temptation claims the battle And it seems the night has won Deeper still then goes the anchor Though I justly stand accused I 
will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever prove. All my hope is in the anchor, it shall never be Christ the sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death when these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath we will cross that great horizon clouds behind and life secure the calm will be the better for the storms that we endured. Christ the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. We will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to post those pictures. Make sure that you tag us and check in at Phillips Chapel. We'd love to see what worship looked like for you. And uh, please give and support our missionaries. They're in unique circumstances too with all of this pandemic and shutdown and everything. And so please make sure that you go to phillipschapel.org slash give and support our missionaries and our ministry as well. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. You are loved. Boy, we miss you. God bless you. We will see you soon.